Who are we? Where did we come from? And where are we going? These are questions man has asked himself since the dawn of time. Images from archaeological digs from all over the world have two things in common. Number one, depictions of giants. Number two, UFOs. Egyptian, Mayan, Sumerian, Babylonian, Indian, American Indians like the Hopi, Tibetans, Ancient China, Berbers, Easter Island, Stonehenge, and many, many others all have these two things in common, the giants and the UFOs. It seems like people from our past are trying to tell us something. Exactly what they are trying to tell us still remains a mystery. My name is Fritz K.O. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Don't forget to hit the like button and the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. The main focus of this video will be the Sumerians, since they're often brought up as the first known human civilization. It has also been said by the Sumerians themselves that we as a human race were created by beings from outer space which some theorize led to the creation of the RH negative bloodlines. Let's take a look at the Sumerians. Who were they? Where did they come from? And how did they live? The Sumerians were the first people to migrate to Mesopotamia around 55,000 years ago. The origins of the Sumerian civilization are still highly debated today. Here is what we do know. They created a great civilization and made many advances in technology. The Sumerians may have invented the phalanx formation that Alexander the Great used to conquer most of the known world of his time and siege warfare, along with inventing writing, the wheel, the plow, law codes, literature, uh, the, the 60 minute hour, the 62nd, these are things we still use today. The Sumerians are also remembered as some of history's original beer brewers. Also, they were some of the first to depict giants and debatably a map of our solar system. Archaeological evidence indicates that they established roughly a dozen city-states. These usually consisted of a walled metropolis with a ziggurat at the center a pyramid-like temple structure that has been associated with Sumerian religion. Complex irrigation canals were dug to harness the waters of the Tigris and Euphrates for farming. Major Sumerian city-states included Iteru, Ur, Nippur, Lagesh, and Kish, but one of the oldest and most sprawling was Uruk a thriving trading hub that boasted six, million, six miles of defensive walls and a population of between 40 and 80,000. At its peak, around 2800 BC, it was most likely the largest city in the world at the time. One of the greatest sources of information on ancient Mesopotamia is the so-called King's List, a clay tablet that documents the names of most of the ancient rulers of Sumer, as well as the lengths of their reigns. One early king is said to have lived for 43,000 years. So the list seems to be a blend of fact and myth. Or were people somehow able to live that long back then? What do you guys think? Leave a comment. The Sumerian invention of cuneiform dates to sometime around 3400 BC. In its most sophisticated form, it consists of several hundred characters that ancient scribes used to write words or symbols on wet clay tablets with a reed stylus. The tablets were then baked or left in the sun to harden. The Sumerians seem to have first developed cuneiform for the mundane purpose of record keeping or business transactions but over time it blossomed into a full-fledged writing system used for everything from poetry and history to law codes and literature. 
Since the script could be adapted to multiple languages, it was later used over the course of several millennia by more than a dozen different cultures. In fact, archaeologists have found evidence that the texts were still being written in cuneiform as recently as the first century AD. The epic Gilgamesh is a 3,000 line poem that follows the adventures of a Sumerian king as he battles a forest monster and quests after the secrets of eternal life. While the poem's hero is a demigod with Hercules-like strength, most scholars believe he is based on an actual king who served as the fifth ruler of the city of Uruk. The historical Gilgamesh appears on the Sumerian kings list and is thought to have lived somewhere around 2700 BC. Few contemporary accounts on his reign have survived to today, but archaeologists have found inscriptions that credit him with building Uruk's massive defensive walls and restoring a temple to the goddess Nihilnil, which suggests he may have been a real ruler whose deeds were later repurposed as myth. Cool side note, Samaria once had a female ruler. Sumer's lone female monarch Kubaba, a woman tavern keeper, who supposedly took the throne in the city-state of Kish sometime around 2500 BC, very little is known about her reign or how she came to power, but the list credits her with making firm the foundations of Kish, forging a dynasty that lasted a hundred years. Examination of ancient myths, legends, Ritual texts and images reveal that most Sumerian gods and or Anunnaki were conceived in human terms. They had human or human-like forms, were male or female, engaged in intercourse, reacted to stimuli with both reason and emotion. Being similar to humans, they were considered to be unpredictable and oftentimes capricious. Their need for food and drink, housing, and care mirrored that of humans. Unlike humans, however, they were immortal, and like kings and holy temples, they possessed a splendor called Melamanu. Melamanu is a radiance or aura, a glamour that the gods embodied, or embodied them. It could be fearsome or awe-inspiring. Temples also had Melamanu. The principal gods were masculine and had at least one consort. Gods also had families. Possessing powers greater than that of humans, many gods were also associated with astral phenomena such as the sun, moon, the stars, shooting stars, others with the forces of nature such as winds and fresh ocean waters, Yet others were, were real animals, lions, bulls, wild oxen, and various others. Imagine creatures such as fire-spitting dragons, and some as giants. Were some of these early humans really that big? Leave a comment, tell me what you think. The Bible says yes. I'm not saying that's proof, but it is interesting. In the Bible, the giants are referred to as Nephilim, and there was a lot of them. Angels bred with mankind and created a race of demigods. At least that's how the story in the Bible goes. The Nephilim are said to have mostly all been wiped out with the great flood of Noah's time. Although the Sumerian gods were said to be immortal, some slain in divine combat had to reside in the underworld along with demons. They called it the land of no return. Many deities were depicted in human form, different from mortals by their size and by the presence of headgear with various different types of animals being used for that headgear. These could have been war helmets and or ceremonial headdress. One could only speculate. Deities could also be represented by symbols or emblems. According to recently excavated clay tablets inscribed with cuneiform script, thousands of Sumerians, the first humans to establish systems of writing, agricultural, and government, were working on their sophisticated irrigation systems, 
when the Father of all creation reached down from the ether and contacted their thriving civilization. I do not understand, reads an ancient line of pictographs depicting the sun, the moon, water, and a Sumerian who appears to be scratching his head. A booming voice is saying in the inscription, let there be light. The Sumerian then replies, let there be light, but there is already light. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass. And the Sumerian said, but I am already standing on grass. The Sumerian goes on, everything is here already. The pictograph continues, we do not need more stars. Historians believe that immediately following the biblical event, Sumerian witnesses returned to the city of Erdu, a bustling metropolis built 1,500 years before God called out to them. According to records, Sumerian farmers, priests, and civic administrators were not only befuddled, but also took issue with the face of God moving across the water saying that he scared those who were traveling to Mesopotamia to participate in their vast and intricate trade system. Paul Heland, ancient history professor at Cornell U University, said, If what the pictographs indicate are true, his loud voice interrupted their ancient prayer ritual for an entire week. According to the cuneiform tablets, Sumerians found God's most puzzling act to be the creation of from dust to the first two human beings. These two people made in his image did not know how to communicate, lack skills in both mathematics and farming, and have the intellectual capacity of an infant. One Sumerian philosopher wrote, they must be the creation of a complete idiot. The Epic of Gilgamesh, from the time it was rediscovered and reconstructed in the late 19th century, has created a sense of controversy and curiosity among historians of the ancient Near East. A huge reason for the excitement was the incorporations of other stories and the evidence of the flood story from Genesis within the Epic of Gilgamesh. With this, the Epic creates a parallel to the Bible and the Society of Mesopotamia nearly 4,000 years ago. Gilgamesh is known to be the first great hero, and the epic is known to be the first great masterpiece of world literature. With this story, we can learn a lot about Mesopotamia culture and their religion. Gilgamesh was a demigod created by the Anunnaki. The epic Gilgamesh recounts the tale of the hero king of ancient Mesopotamia. Gilgamesh has encounters with creatures, kings, and gods, and also provides a story of human relationships, feelings, loneliness, friendship, loss, love, revenge, and the fear of death. He is the wisest, strongest, and the most handsome of all mortals, and is two-thirds god and one-third man. He is the king of the city-state Uruk and builds a huge wall around the city. In the process, he overworks his citizens to the point that they begin to pray to the Anunnaki for relief. The god Anu hears their prayers and called on the goddess Aruru to create another mortal god like Gilgamesh. In order for peace in Uruk, the two will have to fight for the right to rule. Enkidu is created from clay and is sent to live among the animals. He is known as the equal to Gilgamesh, but is more native and primal. The two enemies become inseparable best friends. After time, Gilgamesh proposes a dangerous adventure to the Cedar Forest, in which they will encounter the great and terrible guardian, Hamababa. The friends take off with special weapons and are under the protection of the sun god. Once they reach the Cedar Forest, Enikadu tries to convince Gilgamesh to turn back, but the sun god urges them to continue and confront Humababa. But Idikahu eventually persuades Gilgamesh to destroy Humababa. And they return to Uruk. The hero Gilgamesh 
is pursued by the goddess Ishtar. But knowing her past with lovers, Gilgamesh rejects her invitation, which only managed to ir- irritate and anger her. In retaliation, Ishtar sends down the Bull of Heaven, which Gilgamesh and Enkidu are able to defeat. Enkidu was perhaps made more fully in Gilgamesh's image than the gods had planned. The gods and or Anunnaki decide that one of the demigod warriors must die in retribution for the slaying of Hamababa and the Bull of Heaven. They end up deciding Enkidu is the one who must die. Gilgamesh is devastated by the loss of his friend and decides to rebel and sets out to find the secret of eternal life. Oh my God. Gilgamesh meets with Utanapanistamim, who has received the gift of eternal life. To learn his secrets, Utanapanistamim tests him by forcing Gilgamesh to go without sleep. As a test, that's a test that Gilgamesh fails and is sent away. Eutistamonum's wife urges that they give Gilgamesh something to reward him for his quest, and they decide that they should give him the plant of rejuvenation, which will allow him to live his life over again. Unfortunately for Gilgamesh, he loses the plant to a snake, kind of like the biblical story of humanity lost to a snake in the Garden of Eden and has to return home empty-handed with no solution to eternity or a second chance at life. The story of Gilgamesh transcends such knowledge in a series of stages that leads him by steps to the highest knowledge, which is, after all, the goal of all men. Okay, so who were the Anunnaki? The Anunnaki were a group of ancient Sumerian gods descended from the supreme deity An but some historians claim the Sumerians may have believed them to be extraterrestrial. The Anunnaki appear in the mythological traditions of ancient Sumerians, the Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians. Enki, the chief Anunnaki, was a child of An, the chief god of gods who ruled over all gods in ancient Sumeria. They were sky gods who came from the heavens, and Babylonian creation myths say that there were 300 Anunnaki assigned to guard the heavens. The Anunnaki make an appearance in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Fast forward to the 19th century, archaeologists uncovered tens of thousands of ancient Babylonian clay tablets. The collections were so vast that research and translation on them continue to this present day. Author Zachariah Sitchin wrote a book on the translations. Stitchin book claims that ancient Sumerians said that Anunnaki came from a mythical planet called Nibiru. Nibiru, according to Stitchin, has an elongated orbit of 36,000 years. When Nibiru was close to Earth at one point in the distant past, the Anunnaki decided to say hello to humanity. This would have been around 4,500,000 years ago. They landed in Samaria. They needed gold to repair their planet's atmosphere. The Anunnaki couldn't mine the gold themselves, so they created a race of beings called humans to do the work for them. It has been thought that this was where humanity made its split between positive and negative blood types. Humans, therefore, were made to serve alien masters who needed Earth's mineral wealth to sustain their civilization for whatever reason. This is what Stitchin describes in his books that he was able to depict from their writings. Humans were created for the use as intelligent slaves. Sumerians said that Anunnaki took a part of the rib from primitive man. Why they chose the rib? They chose the rib because the rib is a great source for extracting DNA from bone marrow, one would only guess. Sumerians wrote that the Anunnaki then manipulating the DNA of man created multiple different types of humans and other creatures as well. It is said to have been a learning process for the first couple of times, and the first couple times didn't go so well. I think the RH negatives were one of the first 
lines of humans to be created and also some of the first to rebel. Thought to have all been killed out because that's what Sumerians said the Anunnaki did with humans they created that were not obedient, the Great Flood, etc. The surviving RH negatives hid in the mountainous regions of the early known world. These people would later become the Bass, the Berbers, and all the other RH negative blood types that still live in mountainous regions today and have since the dawn of recorded time. They never have been kicked off their lands, and every empire on the historical record has tried. The people in Bath today speak a language that's origin is unknown, yet I have examined it, and it resembles Sumerian. Check it out. Tell me what you guys think. Leave a comment. The comparison of Sumerian language with Basque shows similarity. I'm going to put this up for you guys to look at. Hit pause. Check it out your guys' self. Tell me what you think. It seems like Budline ORH negative was brought to Europe from the Middle East. Now this next part is going to be shocking. Researchers have said that Mary Magdalene and Jesus Christ moved to southern France. This is the same area where the Basque live today. And then, the RH negative bloodline spread out from the Middle East to Egypt and on to Morocco from Morocco up into Spain and then finally settling in today's Basque region between France and Spain. The Shroud of Turin Jesus Christ blood stain is said to be RH negative. As Persian and Roman empires came to an end, the elite left Europe and took with them their RH negative bloodlines. It seems like they have been controlling society since the very first societies in Samaria, debatably 20,000 to 30,000 years ago. From the collapse of Samaria, probably to India and China, and then from there to the Middle East before coming to Europe. It's all highly debatable, but this may be the lost history of the Aryan race that the Nazis were looking for. Wild, huh? Okay, back to the Anunnaki and the rebel RH negatives. So the RH negatives hid in the mountains and were the main force, but also with the help of the more subservient, positive bloodline and demigods, Enki overthrew the Anunnaki. Eventually, all the demigods died out and or disappeared along with the Anunnaki or were killed like in the story of David and Goliath. The RH negatives then took over everything, some deciding to go back to mountainous regions and others becoming the ruling class of the first human societies all across the globe. Starting religions and secret societies as a means to manipulate and control the masses. The ruling class have interbred so much that their bloodlines are ruined, and most of them truly are insane, and they run our world we live in and control our lives. People ask me all the time, where do I think the RH negatives come from? And I think the theory that I put forth in this video could possibly be true. If aliens did actually come here and create us humans as the Sumerians wrote. Final thought. There seems to be 
a lot of unsubstantiated and largely meaningless claims on one side and science on the other. Not all opinions are equally valid. Thank you for watching Giants and UFOs. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, hit the like button, leave a comment, hit the notification bell. Look for part two and more videos. Thank you. Have a nice day.